Chapter 11 Staging Murder Dr. Bunnicott gracefully put on his gloves. He raised his head to look at the body with his daring and intelligent gaze, seeming like he had no fear. His dark brown eyes scanned and memorized every detail into his brain while analyzing relevant information the police needed. Who was the deceased? It was obvious, from people who knew the deceased, an ID card, an employee card, and his dwelling, that this man was Chan Chai Manaret, Farm D. He was the one who couldn't have been contacted since yesterday and was the one whom Inspector Vassan suspected of attacking him in his home. Where did he die? Bunnicott looked for any traces of the body's relocation since there were no visible stains of blood or any secretions. Plus, the body posture appeared that his arms and legs were stretched vertically by the gravity, which could be assumed that he died on the spot or he had been hanged before his corpse went into rigor mortis. When did he die? Bunnicott nodded at Anon signaling the man to help him with the corpse while he moved the biggest joint in the human body, the hip joint. It had already gone stiff. The pathologist kneeled, pressing his hands on the corpse's instep skin, which appeared crimson red from the blood falls due to gravity. This man had been dead for six to eight hours, which was about 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. that morning. What was the cause of death? By the looks of it, Mr. Chanchai died by hanging. The next thing Barnaket needed to figure out was that he died before or after he was hanged. If he had died before he was dangling like that, it would be a totally different case. However, this question could be answered after they performed an autopsy to find any traces of physical injuries or poisoning at the forensic department. A manner of death. Bunnicott took a deep breath when he reached this step. He dragged a chair, the one that wasn't lying on the floor, and stepped on it to take a better look at a knot and ligature marks on Chan Chai's neck. What he saw almost made him stop breathing. This wasn't the first time he found a case like this. Bunnicott could see ligature marks made by another material under the rope that was used to hang him. This strangulation left a clear, visible mark, the one that could depict its violence. Even clearer than the previous case he had experienced. I found a suicide note upstairs. Everyone looked up, following the voice of the officer who had investigated on the second floor. It was typed in a computer on his desk. The deputy superintendent, who was also at the crime scene, looked at Bunnicott. I'll go upstairs to take a look, Dr. Bunn. Call me if you need me. Bunnicott nodded and stepped down from the chair, taking his gloves off his hands. He turned to look at the officer who was waiting for his report on the post-mortem. I couldn't determine the cause of death right now. I'd like to request an autopsy. The police officer nodded. Still can't conclude that it's a suicide, right? From his previous experience, Bunnicott learned that he shouldn't alert other people with his speculations, because he would never know whether there was a murder in this room. The manner of death indicates suicide, but I want to perform an autopsy to confirm it. Deputy Superintendent Bert walked down the stairs with a picture on his phone. He then approached Bunnicott and read the message he took from the computer screen to him. I couldn't live with this guilt anymore. What I did was unforgivable. It'd be better if I just ended my life. I thought I was a sufferer reliever of those dying patients, but in the end, the one who suffered is me. Forgive me for every soul I have taken away from your loved ones. I apologize to Inspector Vassan, whom I've tried to assault because of my stupidity. And I apologize to Dr. Guntabat that I couldn't put what you've thought into practice the way you wanted. Booze. Bert looked up at Bunnicott. Two men appeared on this message. I'm not skeptical about Vassan, but who is this Dr. Guntapat? Bunnicott knew awfully well who this Guntapat was. 
but what made him momentarily stunned was the message the deceased left behind. How did the name of the family physician appear on this note? And what exactly did Guntapat teach pharmacist Booz? He's a family physician who started working here at roughly at the same time as me. Bunnikit quickly said what was on his mind. But if pharmacist Booz wasn't the one who typed this message, then it would lose the meaning, right? Bert frowned. What do you mean? Bunnikit tried to suppress what he wanted to say the most. He only meant that pharmacist Booz might not be alive to write that suicide note on his own, so the person who typed the message could make up any false information or frame anybody. Nothing, sir. I'll perform an autopsy at the lab again to confirm the cause of death. You're not as adventurous as you used to be, Doc. Bert tapped on Bunnikit's shoulder. Then I'll go outside to tell the reporters that it might be the suicide from the guilt, and that we've to wait for further postmortem report. Of course. Bunnikit's gaze followed Bert, until he was out of sight. He then stepped aside, allowing Anon to take pictures of the corpse more conveniently. An idea sparked in Bunnikit's mind. He liked to play games with himself. If there was a murder case, he liked to secretly guess who the murderer was. All this time, his predictions was precise until Jangiera's murder case. Bunnikit closed his eyes, trying to suppress one name that kept resurfacing on his mind. He wouldn't jump to any conclusions. Never again. Let the police do their investigation. His only duty was to perform the autopsy. Vassan's expression didn't look so good when he heard what had happened from a junior police officer. He hurriedly pushed himself up, looking for the closest nurse and raised his hand to call her. Excuse me. Narm walked up to him. Is there anything I can help? The doctor said I could go home now. When can I leave? There is a case in the hospital. I need to go there. You can change your clothes and wait for the final hospital discharge. Right now, we're almost done with your hospital discharge and your appointment receipt. Then, please take the appointment receipt for me. I need to hurry. Vassan told the police officers in uniforms before asking them to lower the bed rail so he could get out of it. He then walked towards a shared toilet in the medical ward and changed his clothes from the light green patient garb to his t-shirt and cocky pants he had worn before he got into the hospital. When he walked out of the toilet, he met a tall man in a short lab coat. Vassan went silent for a moment, like he fell into a trance. You've heard the news? Gunn asked quietly. I'm going to see the crime scene. They've already brought down the body. It's being sent to the forensic department. Gunn watched Vassan with eyes full of concern. Are you sure you're okay now? I'm fine. Vassan walked past Gunn and headed towards one of the nurses. You can leave the receipt and the flowers to the officer. I must go to work now. After finishing talking, he turned on his heels and rushed towards the door of the medical ward. Gunn increased his speed to catch up with him before Vassan could ride an elevator down. Why did you tell your colleague that pharmacist Booz was the suspect? Gunn asked while the two of them were in the elevator together. Because when I questioned him about the missing drugs, his reaction was so suspicious. It's my mistake to ask him that. Vassan massaged his knitted eyebrows. Don't you have work to do? I have a patient to visit at 1.30pm. I knew that you were going to be discharged today, so I decided to drop by. Gunn placed his hand on Vassan's cheek, stroking his thumb over the soft skin. I was so worried about you. Don't do anything reckless again. Understood? Gunn's touch gave a sensation of faint electric current, sending a thrill and pleasure to him. Not only on the area Gunn's hands caressed, but it also reached deep inside his chest. In the quiet elevator, there were only them. Vassan's heartbeat was pounding that he heard it clearly in his ears. Gunn's hand not only seized his cheek, but also his heart, squeezing it tightly so that he couldn't run away. Vassan considered this feeling as an infatuation, in which he couldn't decide if it was beautiful or terrifying. 
He closed his eyes, leaning into that hand. Gunn lowered his hands to Vasan's shoulders, pushed him against the elevator, causing a loud thud, and bent down to kiss Vasan on the lips. He bit those lips while locking his guy in his arms, then placed a kiss on his neck. One of Gunn's hands moved down to squeeze Vasan's firm ass. The numb pain on the spot where the intruder had injected the drug woke Vasan up from the trance. He quickly pushed Gunn away about the same time as the elevator arrived on the ground floor. Both of them returned to stand in the middle while adjusting their slightly messy clothes. What the heck? Vasan grumbled in a low voice and rushed out of the elevator, pretended like nothing had happened. No worries. This elevator doesn't have any security cameras. Then tell them to install some. Vasan growled. He quickly stepped away from Gun. If they do, then we couldn't do that anymore. You... Just shut up. Where are you going? To the crime scene. The residence behind the hospital. Unlike you, I've work to do. I can't follow anyone around. And do you know the way? Vassan suddenly halted. Gunn chuckled and took this chance to lead the way. Follow me. Vassan followed Gunn to the front of Pharmacist Booth's residence. There were police cars and three police officers standing with a group of people who should be local reporters. When Vassan approached, one of the officers walked straight to him. How are you now, Inspector? I'm fine. Vassan anxiously looked at the residence. They've already moved the body to the forensic lab, but the crime scene investigators are still gathering fingerprints in there. The senior sergeant major rushed to interrupt Vassan, who was very determined to go in there. Inspector Superintendent Burt said that if you're out of the hospital, he wanted to see you at once. Vassan stared at him for a second before giving up the idea of going into the crime scene. Where is he? At the police station. Please get in the car, Inspector. I'll take you there. He pointed to a white red pickup truck parking nearby. Vasa nodded, turning to look at Gunn, who refused to go anywhere. Thank you for bringing me here. I'd better get back to work. The way the senior sergeant major looked at the both of them was as if he knew some hidden secrets. Vasa tried not to overthink that his relationship with Gunn was known. By now, the cell phone on his desk during the incident must have been thoroughly examined by his peers. Vasan only hoped that everyone would see it as a private matter that didn't interfere with his work. But he was so wrong. A case file of a terminal cancer patient who was injected with antidepressant and resulted in his death was placed on a desk between Police General Tian Chai, the superintendent of this police station, and Vasan, who was standing with his hands behind his back. Vasan looked at the file with his blank eyes. He knew what would happen even if the superintendent didn't say a word. Dr. Gantabad's name appeared on the pharmacist's suicide note. Please summon him for interrogation today. Vasan closed his eyes, trying to contain emotions that rolled inside him. Then I'll issue a subpoena. You know that you should do something else other than issuing the subpoena, Inspector Vasan. Chan Chai leaned into his chair, glaring at Vasan with his intense gaze. Vasan clenched his fists and pressed his lips together. He wanted to resist, but in the end, he dejectedly surrendered. I will recuse myself from the case, sir. Seeing this, the middle-aged superintendent nodded. Deputy Superintendent Burt will take over the case. We need your cooperation. If you know something else about this person, tell Deputy Superintendent Bird Everything. But if you cover up for him, you and your partner might be charged with conspiracy. Vasan took a deep breath to ease the feeling of having a leather boot kicked in his chest. A remark full of disdain, a feeling of disgust and full of discrimination were obvious in his voice and facial expression. Police General Chan Chai got out of his chair, walking firmly out of the room, leaving Vasan standing alone with his hands behind his back in that silent room. I've given lectures on the principle of palpative care for everyone in this hospital. 
Dr. Gantapa told the officer in front of him firmly. Not just once, but at least five times in this hospital that I've given such lectures on a good death. Not to mention countless invitation to be a guest speaker outside the hospital. If someone wanted to appropriate my name, I wouldn't be surprised. You mean that you aren't complicit in the pharmacist abuse on your concept? I'm totally not complicit in his activity, and what I've been lecturing isn't even my idea. It's a universal principle that specialists like me used widely around the world. I've been mentioned in several international textbooks. I just studied those texts and cited documents from various sources for my lecture, that's all. It wasn't my own idea. Guntapa clasped his hands on the desk, looking at his surroundings with a frightened expression. I'm shocked my name appeared on that note. I insist that pharmacist Booth and I really know each other. We visit the patients together from time to time, but we barely talked. Deputy Superintendent Bird stared at Guntapet's handsome face. He tried to catch any dodgy sign, but after their conversation, he hadn't found anything suspicious. Has pharmacist Booth ever attended your lecture? Yes, he has. He's attended my lecture, and he's one of the pharmacists who coordinate with visiting teams. What do you think Pharmacist Booth meant in the suicide note? Saying that he couldn't put what you have taught into practice the way you want it. I guess that... Gunn answered patiently. He might have performed euthanasia. Bert raised his eyebrows. You mean a practice that a doctor kills a patient? It literally means a good death, but in this textbook, it means the practice that the patients choose to end their lives with the assistance of people with medical knowledge. I've given lectures about this matter a couple of times, using general knowledge combined with religious and law analysis from around the world. Everything I've said was a fact. Guntapad seemed thoughtful. He might have tried to abuse that I lectured and failed. Those patients might not have good deaths, in accordance with the theory that I've thought. So he might want to say sorry to me. Have you ever provided an example in what the pharmacist has done? Guntabet smiled lightly, showing his sincerity. Absolutely not. What have you been doing from 4am to 6am this morning? I was sleeping in my house. Guntabet leaned into his chair with an awkward face. I bought a house in a housing estate. If you wanted to check the period I went in and out of my house, security cameras in front of my housing estate should have recorded everything. Last night, after I got Inspector Vassan admitted into the hospital ward at 1am, I arrived home half an hour later and came out to work at 7am. Bert had to release Guntapat because he didn't have enough proof to recommend a charge on the man. After a long period of investigation, Guntapet didn't reveal any unusual reaction. For his lack of circumstantial evidence, Bert would send his men to retrieve the recorded footage from the security cameras in front of Guntapet's housing estate. Aside from that, Bert just received information from a brief autopsy result when he called upon the forensic pathologist. It appeared that there were ligature marks on his neck, which had occurred before he was hanged for a cover-up. After combining all these information, Bert came to the conclusion that Booth might not type the suicide note himself, and if Dr. Guntapet was the murderer, he wouldn't be foolish enough to type his name on the note. Lieutenant Kong? Bert looked out the window, to the physician who was walking to the parking lot in front of the police station. He spoke to a man in a long-sleeved, black leather shirt with jeans standing behind him. Get to know the doctor at once, and watch him like a hawk. Keeping an eye on one doctor should be easier than a sting operation. Kong put his hands in his pocket casually. I'll send my minions to follow him. Do not disappoint me. You have eyes like a pineapple. A pineapple only has a few tens of eyes. But I have more than that. The detective touched his cropped, short hair. By the way, is the doctor a gay partner of our inspector? Correct. Kong seemed excited. Uh-huh, interesting. 
Find only useful information, no private business nonsense, unless you think Vassan conspires with him. In that case, report it to me at once. Yes, sir. The man who didn't look like a cop at all nodded. He put on his black cap before disappearing quietly from the room. Kong was an agile detective who could be on intimate terms with everyone and always knew his way around. He was like an unseen shadow, monitoring and collecting useful information from various sources. So he was known as the Pineapple-Eyed Detective. Bert didn't know who exactly were these Lieutenant Kong's minions, but he wouldn't bother asking. He only wanted sufficient evidence to charge the suspect. That was the only thing that could make him satisfied. 